Hello and welcome to the Gold, Goats, and Guns Market Report for today, Sunday, February 25th, 2024. My name is Tom Luongo, and we have a lot to talk about. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. I have just confirmed with Sean Newman of the Sean Newman Podcast. Uh, we've been in discussion for a couple of weeks now trying to figure out when we could, what weekend uh, in April or early May, we could do a conference up in uh, Lloyd Minster again. He's got an all-day conference thing um, that he's been trying to put together. Uh, last year, Alex and Alex Craner and I did the the two-hour show that we did um, last time, and, and uh, that was great fun because we got to meet all sorts of people, and, you know, we did the thing, and we were there for a few days, and it was a lot of fun. And But it was only two hours. This time, uh, Sean is putting on an all-day affair, um, and from what I understand... As of right now, it's going to be myself, Alex, uh, Mikhail Thorpe of uh, the Expat Money guys, and uh, I know Martin Armstrong is also going to be there and a couple others. So uh, Sean's put together a pretty good lineup for the entire day. It's going to be fun. And yeah, technically, I'm the headline speech. So um, I have to give a 30-minute talk and Q&A, and it's going to be fun. So um, I don't, you're going to probably head over to SeanNewmanPodcast.com. I'll put a link over there. I don't know if um, um, I don't know if that's up yet, right? I saw not, I just saw a mock up of the early banner for the thing. I don't know if it's up yet, but I'm letting everybody know that I'm now confirmed because I got you know plane ticket information from Sean last night. So it's going to be the weekend of the 29th of April, uh, 28th, 29th of April, whichever day that is. Um, I guess it's something like that. Um, that weekend, the last weekend in April. Um, we'll be up there and I'll be up there from, we're flying in on a Thursday beforehand. The, this conference is on a Saturday, I'm flying in on Thursday. So I'll be there all day Friday. I'll be in Lloyd Minster all day Saturday, obviously. And then we're not flying back until Monday morning. So I'll be in Alberta, kind of the same thing as last time I was, we flew, Camille and I flew in on Thursday evening. And then there was, an, and I had a couple of days on either side of the, of the show. Uh, to do a thing. So I'm sure that um, Sean will want to, you know, do a podcast with with us or something like that as well. But I, I, I'm i sure he's got other things he'll plan out. Um, but there should be time if uh, any of you want to, you know, get together in Edmonton or something like that. Let me know. Um, and, uh, you know, you now have uh, the, uh, what do you call? What's the word I'm looking for? You now have the schedule. So you can plan on that. I've confirmed I'm going. Alex is going. Martin Armstrong is going to be there. It's going to be interesting. It should be fun. So thanks to Sean, as always, for putting all this stuff together. And, uh, well, yeah, it should be an interesting time. So let's get started with the market report. All right. So what? We got CPAC going on, right? Every time I say CPAC, I, all I can think of is a CPAP machine. It's really kind of funny. Like, because honestly, at times, I really do feel like... <laughs> Conservatism is on some kind of need of oxygen and life support. Um, sorry, I know it's a ser I know sleep apnea and whatnot is a, is a is a serious issue, but I'm not you know okay. There you go. But what I find interesting is that um, and, and I'm not okay. You you know where I'm going with this, right? We already talked about it in 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 uh, on the Crypto Rich podcast we did last week, and I've already alluded to it and whatnot. I want to like dig in a little bit. The short list for Trump's VP um, is pretty short. And I don't believe that Gabbard's on it. Oh, I will say this up front. I think she should be on it. And I'm in the minority when it comes to um, Dexter and our social group of, of, uh, of political um, obnoxious jerks uh elitist jerks as it were if you're a world of warcraft fan you'll know exactly what i mean by elitist jerk um but i think gabbard should be in the conversation i believe that she actually is in the conversation because you know trump just likes attractive women okay there's a couple of things so she spoke at cpac over the weekend she took the democrats to task blah she did what she what, what gabbard always does um and i think that the short list is for his for Trump's real VP is Tim Scott. Now, on this front, I agree with Dexter. All right, he and I've talked talked about this at length. Um, but that being said, 
And his political instincts on, on this stuff are usually pretty strong. Um, but that said, Trump may go the Gabbard route, but I'll tell you what he's really doing right now. What he's really doing is using Tulsi Gabbard. And she's happily allowing herself to be used. She's being used as and floated as a VP front runner. She's going to like have dinner with Trump at Mar-a-Lago and all of this stuff on purpose to drive the Democrats crazy, especially to drive the Clintonistas crazy and to drive Hillary crazy because Hillary fucking hates Tulsi Gabbard with absolute purple passion because Tulsi crossed Hillary in 2016 and later, and they have targeted her on multiple occasions since then. And Gabbard just looked at her and gone, I don't care. You're just a terrible old freaking woman and I don't care. And for that reason alone, and the, you know, the pig roast she made of fucking freaking Kamala Harris at the, the 2020 um, debates and all the rest of it, you know, Gabbard's got some stones. And I don't care if you like her or you don't like her. She's strong enough in the Second Amendment, this, that, and everything else. At the end of the day, Tulsi Gabbard's got stones. You don't have to agree with everything about her. You don't have to agree. You don't have to like, you don't have to like her. But you do have to respect where she's carved, the position she's carved for herself as a, um, as a political figure in America during a very tumultuous time, she has navigated the political waters perfectly. And you can argue that she's some WEF, you know, triple secret probation agent and all the rest of it. And that's just bullshit. They fucking hate her, and they fucking and, and that's that's the end of it. And it doesn't go any farther than that. Okay, it's like the it's like the, the people still arguing that Trump is you know somehow you know. A triple agent and it's just it's just dumb like he's a stalking horse for the globalists it's just dumb now trump is just an idiot and trump is many things but he's not a stalking horse for these globalists he has globalist tendencies he's barely a friggin' quote-unquote republican and you know by any reasonable stretch of the definition of the word and yada 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 which really means libertarian but that's the way it is and that's who we have and you know you don't go into battle with you know, the generals you want and the army you want. You go into the battle with the generals and the army you've got. And these are who you got. And I got news for you. You're going up against people who are actually less co- less competent and less qualified than Tulsi Gabbard and Donald Trump. Donald Trump is very... This is where Donald Trump now will begin to shine. Okay? He trounced Nikki Haley last night in, in South Carolina. He only beat her by 20 points, but, you know, every Democrat in South Carolina came out to pad the votes, and I'm sure that there was some, you know, there's some ballot stuffing going on to try and make the, the numbers look better than they actually were. She's clearly just trying to uh, to collect as many delegates as possible in the hopes that they're going to be able to get rid of Trump so that they can go to the convention and she can bullshit shenanigans. Um, that's the only reason she's still in the race. That's it. That's all. It's the only reason she's still in the race. Okay? Now. as a stalking horse for the globalists. That's it. Gabbard is being used to drive the Democrats completely crazy. She's on point with supporting everything that Trump is talking about foreign policy-wise. That's her That's her. Uh, her position. I don't know that she's even in the running for Secretary of State. I'm not even sure that I want her as Secretary of State. I don't know that she has the... Um, she has the experience to be Secretary of State. Okay. I know that she's a, would be actually restore you know diplomacy simply because she likes to talk because she's actually willing to talk to people and negotiate, which would be a, a you know a, a, a sea change in American politics going back to you know the nineteen fifties. But hey, at the very least, you know, I can see that. I don't know that it's going to be Secretary of State. I don't know that it's going to be VP. VP in some ways actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. Because VP is actually not a very important position, not like Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury or anything. You know, major cabinet minister like you know, position like that for Gabbard would be a stretch. But VP. Here's the reason why Gabbard is VP makes the most sense. OK. And that is because she's hated by the Democrats and frankly, the globalists as much as Trump is. Both Trump and Gabbard are, for all intents and purposes, anti-war. 
they're as anti-war as major American politicians can be and still be relevant, okay, given the circumstances, given the level of entangling alliances, and given, frankly, the, um, the position that we've been placed in by our enemies, both foreign and domestic, okay? And that's just reality. Right? And this is, we're not, I'm not going down any kind of purity spiral path here with, you know, I, I need everybody to be thinking completely in terms of real politics at this point, because anything else is, you know, not good analysis. I hate this. I hate to be blunt, but it's true. We have to be thinking only in terms of real politics at this point. Okay. The hour is late. Sauron's forces is already moving and, you know, Theoden's a mess and, and is under control of Saruman, and Saruman is building, you know, breeding orcs and goblins in the caves of Baradur, like, like underneath um, underneath Orthanc. Like, this is what's going on, right? Not a Baradur, but, you know, underneath Orthanc. Come on, this is what's going on. So, as VP, Gabbard can help shape foreign policy, can be a diplomat, and be insurance and be globalist insurance. You have to, of course, believe that the Gabbard isn't a secret, double, you know, triple secret agent for the globalist. You have to believe that. I believe that. And I've been staking my claim on this one for a while now. You know, I have friends who have looked at this and, you know, have brought up the idea that she's just a complete grifter. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's fine. It's a perspective on Tulsi Gabbard and it is something to consider. Is she just grifting, you know, for a political career, knowing she can't get reelected anymore in Hawaii? But if she really wanted to get back into Congress and really wanted to continue doing this stuff, really wanted to get back into Congress, she'd have changed her home state and run again. And she would run in a district, in a currently um, Democrat district, in a, you know, that was stolen. And then she'd run for Congress. But that's a side move for her. But, you know, she could have done it. She didn't want to. What I think is, you know, she's a highly conscientious person that believes in national service, and she did her time. And now she has greater ambitions, and she's allowed to have greater ambitions. You don't have to agree with her. And, you know, I'm not convinced completely convinced about a lot of things, but I get, here's, here's one for you. Like on basis of the, of, of his own, like one of the big gripes that I hear from members of our community and from Dexter is that she's not strong enough on the second amendment. And for him, that's a deal breaker. And that's his, he's like a single issue voter when it comes to the second amendment. And I'm like, I, I get it. And, you know, in many ways I feel the same way, but my single issue was income tax and, you know, what am I going to do there? Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's tell us who's, let's talk about who's, you know, more realistic. The problem with, you know, Gabbard on the Second Amendment is the following. Trump's no good on the Second Amendment. And this is the biggest, and, you know, this is the biggest issue here. Like, I, I, I'm, you know, look, people are, you know, that, that's their feeling. That's what they're, that's what they want, blah, 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 blah. I, I, I get it. I'm not saying, you know, because Trump is bad on the second amendment, therefore you have to excuse, you know, Gabbard's questionable positions on the second amendment. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that, you know, if you disqualify Gabbard for that reason, you have to effectively disqualify Trump for that reason. But given the exigent circumstances, Trump is who is the general we have to go to war with. So there it is. So do you want two bad you want two people with questionable positions on the Second Amendment as both president and vice president. Well, look, I don't see either of them being gun grabbers like of the Obama-Biden ilk. And so to me, I think the Second Amendment issue is one of the lowest priority issues in this particular election. I think I'm more worried about financial reform, the Federal Reserve, taxes, spending. Those are the things that are actually hurting us. Like, they could, what are they going to do? Repeal the Second Amendment and go and try and take 800 million guns from, the, from Americans? No, it's, it's, it's civil war at that point. Like, 
the bigger question, the bigger problem I have is actually Second Amendment wise, is do we all, you know, line up behind General Trump, who then, you know, leads us into a crisis period where he goes, where he's, you know, where his lack of ethics and his lack of a moral compass leads him to, you know, do a gun grab or something dumb. I'm more worried about that from Donald Trump than anything else being maneuvered into that position. And if you don't think that those plans are being drawn up on the whiteboard at Davos Central right now, you're crazy. They are. I, I, I'm, you know, I can absolutely see the, you know, see the flow chart at this point. Well, if we can't stop, if we can't stop him, we can't put him in jail and we can't stop him from being reelected and we can't cheat our way to prosperity and we can't kill him. Then what do we do? And I hate to, you know, burst anybody's bubble, but I don't believe any, I don't believe anybody on the Second Amendment in the Senate who would be a, who would be a good VP candidate for Trump other than Rand Paul. He's the only one I trust. And that's because I know his dad and I know the stock he comes from. Everybody else is questionable. I don't believe Ted Cruz or Tim Scott or Rick Scott or Marco Rubio or anybody else, fucking Mittens or any of the other low lights that are in the Senate. I mean, go go through the Senate and tell me what guys are actually, not the House, the Senate. Because, you know, then we get into, you know, Thomas Massey and Justin Amash and, you know, some of these, and Matt Gates and others. In, in the House, we have real Second Amendment guys. But in the House, but in the Senate, maybe Tommy Tuberville. Right? Maybe. But, you know. You know, Tuberville's not going to be fucking vice president. Give me a break. So high profile. Bring votes. Shore up, you know, shore something up. Rand Paul doesn't make any sense. Aside from being a, a beta male, he's from Kentucky, which they're already going to win. Gabbard brings a lot to the table in a way that blunts so many things, so many attack vectors on Trump, so many classic attack vectors on Trump that it changes the conversation. But at the same time, she's also a lightning rod because it'll just further cement for a lot of people. She's a traitor to the cause because she was a, you know, a good girl and now she's not. So I'm going to vote for Trump even less. So, okay, fine. You know, have fun, you know, at Starbucks, in the original Starbucks in Seattle. Like, who cares? You know, we're not going to win Seattle anyway. Um... I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I can understand what Tim Scott brings to the table, but again, I just don't trust these people. So it's all a minefield between now and then. Gabbard first presented herself and walked away from power. She walked away from power. It's a very important point. Multiple times she walked away from power. And her speech at CPAC was, you know, partisan politics have destroyed the country. There you go. All right, let's talk about the EU real quick. So Bruno Le Maire, the finance minister for the EU, Belgium, I'm not sure. Bruno, he's a, a big wig, big wig globalist and screaming on the other day um, about, well, for all intents and purposes, the great taking. We need to mobilize the $35 trillion in savings that exists in Europe in order to fight climate change, blah, 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 blah. This, is the, this folks, is the great taking. This is what I've been saying since last July when the book was first published. They can get this shit through in Europe. They will not get it through here in the United States. It's not legal, even if they've written laws for it. They, those laws will be challenged in court. The takings will all be destroyed. And, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll be tied up in court until 2060. Are you kidding me? They'll be fighting legal battles in, New York, in, in the United States for 50 years. In Europe, no. They're, they don't have any rights. 
We have a, you know, Europeans, I, I, I hate to remind everybody who's from Europe in the audience, but the United States and Europe are fundamentally different. Fundamentally. At a legal level. And for this reason, and I'm, and I'm like making pregnant Shatner-esque pauses here for effect. This is important. Okay? As, as Dexter says to me all the time, facts matter. Okay? Facts matter. And the fact is, we have rights in this country and a court system that nominally still understands that process. There is then power, which is then placed upon that system to have it lose its validity and have it act against its own best interest. And I'm not arguing that that isn't real. And again, real politic versus, you know, philosophy. But the real politic of trying to steal the collective savings of the United States, I, I would like, I, I would entertain for you, is one of the, it, 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 that's the thing that gets everybody lynched. Everybody lynched. Everybody who wears a, who wears a, a blue stripe, high point, high collared shirt, and a power tie, and worries about the you know the 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 embossing on his business cards, a la Patrick Bateman, will be destroyed, or in a bunker. If this happens, every sneering shitbag judge like Arthur and Goron will be lynched. If they try that, the infrastructure isn't in place for them to do it. It's not there. It's not. The Federal Reserve isn't ready to, you know, turn on the big switch and make give everybody a, an account. Like it's not there. They're doing it in Europe, and this is part of the reason why things like. The EU trying to force Apple to sideload apps onto the iPhone, allow you to jailbreak your iPhone and everything else has nothing to do with sovereignty or private property or anything like that. It has everything to do with them trying to get a hold of the um trying to get a hold of everybody's money. Sideload everything they need. All right, that's what's going on. My phone is blowing up a little bit. Uh, yeah, whatever. I'm going to figure that out. So, um, the, this is the great taking. This is what they had planned. And they're like, and, and there's, you know, and there's Bruno Le Maire, like, screaming, why isn't this happening? What's supposed to have happened by now? Like, <laughs> yeah exactly it didn't so it's not going to and if it does it does happen it's going to happen in europe and it's going to happen in europe after europe has no other options i hate to invoke pa emperor palpatine here but everything is proceeding as i have foreseen These people are literally just the flying monkeys. And they're like, I don't understand why the machine's not working. What happened? I thought, like, I was supposed to get, where are the bolts that I'm supposed to put in the door and, and run the, and put the door on the car? I, I, I don't have any bolts. Like, what's going on here? I thought we had this done by now. We were supposed to have already built trucks. Like, uh, you know, it's like, and, you know, and the, the production line's been shut down. And like it was okay for the first week or two. It's like, no, nah, just get a cup of coffee. Everything's fine. Get a cup of coffee. And then you're like, that was two hours ago. That was two days ago. That was two months ago. We're still having coffee over here. Production line still shut down. You know, parts are back ordered. 
And they don't know what to do. But you can see them out there talking about the things that they were supposed to have gotten done. And then they give more speeches and they lose their minds on uh, in interviews or on TikTok or whatever the hell they do. They're, they're like, And this is what's going on. And it's clear as day that this is what's happening. I'm not saying they're, well, we're winning, but we are racking up, you know, some skirmish victories here. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, that we're, not, we're winning the game. Like, you know, we're still behind. It's still, you know, late third quarter and we're down by a touchdown and a half. But we're not down by three touchdowns anymore. And momentum is on our side. Defense is getting tired. Middle linebacker just, you know, tore an ACL. You know? And to show my age, Roger Staubach just came off the bench to run the two-minute offense. The real two-minute offense. I hate to say this, but if there was ever a better quarterback in the history of the NFL. <laughs> wow. All right. So, you know, that's how that's how far I'm dated. But that's where I think we are. And, you know, under those circumstances, being down 10 points is nothing. So, let's watch to see how this plays out. All right, let's get to the charts. I'll get you out of here. Gold. So, hallelujah. So, one of the themes for this week is that everything's kind of trapped in amber. Things weren't allowed to move. On Wednesday, I was complaining that, you know, oil was still trading and was still tracing an inside bar when it had a 98% chance of throwing an outside bar to the upside, meaning it broke would break the previous high, but not the previous low. Gold was crying in its beer, also refusing to have you know, broken above last week's high. Big orange arrow. What do you see? For the uninitiated. Blow off top. Reaction rally. Sell off. Failed reversal signal because we didn't close. We didn't close above the last high in the down bar. Didn't close with either this bar or this bar. So, right? Another attempt to break and reverse and fail. Like there's two re- two failed reversals back to back here, and then capitulation low below two thousand, which is immediately reversed. So this is one ugly but long seven week or eight week downtrend. Eight week down, uh, seven week downtrend. I can I can count. Right, if you count this one as eight weeks. But here's your one bar reversal, your two failed reversals right here, boom. And then we get the reversal signal here because now we close against the trend with the last bar and the downtrend. Nice, simple, effective. Downtrend established with a series of lower highs and lower lows. And yet within this, we finally got a bullish reversal signal, meaning now gold can attack this level. Now gold can attack that high. Now gold can, and if gold can attack and break and close above this high, this whole formation collapses. And with the reversal signal here, we're in a much better position to think that that's going to be the case. Now they push the dollar down into the end of the week in order to push the price of oil down, in order to push the price of the euro up and bond yields and to mutts with the yield curve in the U.S. and keep everything from collapsing because it was getting a little dicey. And then, but you do all of that and you can't, you know, you know, you can put your fingers in. You can, you got only 10 fingers, but there's an 11th hole. The 11th hole in this case is gold. But not silver. Because silver is much more easily manipulated because silver is not a monetary metal. Silver is an industrial metal. And even though Net- NVIDIA had blowout earnings and that should be hot, good for chip production and all the rest of it, guess what? NASDAQ even outperformed the Dow this week, and yet silver high. We had, you know, this is where we closed last week. We had like a 98% chance or 95% chance of breaking the previous high, and we didn't even come close. We opened down.
and then just close and then just got crushed for the rest of the week. That's okay. Silver recovered into the close and was still closed above this week, above the this high here. That's a good strong sign. And closed near this high, and you know, so closed in this air in this area. And this high here has now been bested two weeks in a row. That's good. So maybe we can get some nice stabilization. And now we have a box we can draw around this. Double bottom here, triple top here. Draw a box around this. And so any break on a weekly closing basis above these highs in here, and that's only 50 cents, 60 cents in silver. That's almost, that's literally nothing. We, we move 50, the average difference between closes every week is 52 cents. That would be enough to break, break us out of this, this, the slump. The range is over a dollar. We've got a coin flip for this week. Huh. Are we, are we surprised about that? Bitcoin. Bitcoin looks very constructive. Here's your, so the shaded areas, the consolidation pattern defined by the range of this bar, ignoring all of the ETF nonsense. And what you wind up with is a very clearly defined consolidation pattern. Once you break and close above that, once you've made the move and moved above it, the top of this, and you get you got the close, then you got the follow through. And now that we've moved into the next area of, you know, this is a nice move from 40 grand to 53. This is going to run into resistance. We had very normal volatility this week. The difference between closes is general. It's supposed to be $1,000. It wasn't. But the range around 2550 bucks. Well, that's about what this is. So these numbers, basically a coin flip. Okay. Why? Because, you know, we tested the previous high. We and, and, and the coin did break the previous high here. It's subtle, but it did do it. But, you know, had one, nothing to do with pulling back to 50. Why? We got the halving in a month and a half. Yada, yada, yada. So, this is nice. I like seeing this. Up, volatile first stage because of the ETF shenanigans, and then up, and so far a pretty stayed and boring second stage. It's usually the other way around. It's usually this is the one that's tight. This one starts getting noisier, and then the third stage is the one where everything is, where it looks like, you know, it looks like the EKG of a heart attack patient. But what we have now is something a little bit, we have the kind of the opposite of that only because of all the ETF nonsense. So this could trade side. I mean, if Bitcoin were to trade sideways for five weeks here, it would set up the halving like you wouldn't believe. It would set up a move to 75 grand. So do you want more fireworks today to engage your, um, your endocrine system? Or do you just want to win? I like winning. I like it when mar I like it when markets aren't emotional, because unemotional markets, up to the upside, are markets that drive them fucking crazy. They thrive on volatility. They thrive on emotion. They try to create emotional instability because that's where they can manipulate markets and manipulate perception. When markets are just boring, like Bitcoin is, has been for the last ten, so seven or eight days, that's unnerving. It's unnerving. Brent crude. If you go to investing.com this morning, you will see prints, final price prints for Brent crude and gasoline that are significantly different than if you were to go and pull the historical data for Friday's close, either the weekly or the daily data. Meaning, someone banged the close on both of those contracts in order to create a print going into Friday afternoon. I almost fell for it. Because I said, oh, look, Brent. 80, I guess I looked at it and I went, Brent, $80.68 or whatever. Like that's, that's bullshit. They banged the close before I even looked at the data. I'm like, 
they bang the clothes. And I, lo and behold, I looked at it and they bang the clothes like 90 cents or something like that. It was just silly. Um, Brent officially closed at like 61 or 81, 62 or something like that last week. Um, but, you know, the investing.com price is almost a dollar underneath that. So somebody just traded one contract, a dollar underneath the market after everybody had shut off their quote boards. They had the same thing in gasoline, except they did it to the upside. Gasoline officially closed at 227 a gallon um, this week. But if you look at investing.com, it printed at almost $2.51 a gallon. And since in about three or four slides or two or three slides, I'm going to show you, you know, I would have the normal, just the gasoline price on the, um, on the, the big currency and bond rate chart, um, you know, slide. I've added gasoline to the bottom. And I had originally done that chart first and just took the quote and went, oh, 251. Wow. Holy Christ. Cool. Oh, there comes back inflation. Fed's not going to cut. And I was already starting to like build a, a narrative in my head. And then I said, well, when I started to build the, the, the Brent crude um, slide next, what did I find? Because I did that next. I said, yeah, let's go put up a, a let's go put up the a real chart of the uh, let's put up the the gasoline weekly chart. And then I saw the big down bar. I was the big up bar. I'm like, I don't trust that. Because remember, you know, when you when you load up when you load up a quote page, it generally gives you the intraday chart, like a fifteen minute chart. And I looked and I saw the big boner bar in the last fifteen minute candle. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I had to go back and I looked at historical data, and then I produced an updated version of this chart. What I want you to note about uh, gasoline futures is that we got the reversal signal in January. Here's your downtrend. We closed here, which is above this the last high in the downtrend. This is a bullish reversal signal, and we're getting follow through action. Higher high, higher low, outside bar to the upside this month. Exactly what you would expect if this reversal, this one bar reversal, you know, was real. This is the kind of thing you're expecting to see happen 80% of the time. Because you get followed through by a bullish outside bar where you break the previous high but not the previous low and you establish a new uptrend. For how long? Oh, a week, one bar, two bars, three bars, five bars, 12 bars, I don't know but it should extend into the next week at a minimum. So here we are. So as long as they don't pull any shenanigans where we got a break, where this, where in the next four trading days, we got a break of this low, this, and we close below this low, which is like $1.95 a gallon, gasoline futures are in an uptrend. That means Inflation is in an uptrend. That means the Fed can't cut rates. And as long as the as long as the rest of the data, the economic data, it doesn't suck completely, the Fed is going to continue with their statements that inflation is not fully tamed and we're not ready to cut rates yet. And waffle, waffle, waffle. And you know the translation shorter. The, the short answer is after the, you strip out all the Fed speak, it is higher for longer. Your move, Chrissy. All right, Sunday, Patreon request hour. I got four of them, and I hope I did this right, but because this just seems like a weird request because both of these aren't these. Are, so this is TR, this is ticker symbol TRM, the ADR, uh, and it's an, it's not, it's an over the counter bulletin board stock, Tor Minerals. It's an old company. And then this is Torm, T O R M. Ticker symbol TRMD, which is an old UK shipping company. If this was meant to be one recommendation or whatever you want to call it, one, one, uh, one request. Well, guess what? We're going to do this weird one. So Tor Minerals is a little company um, that produces specialty um, materials. It's a UK company. I think it's a UK company. It produces specialty materials. It produces like heat heat resistant ceramics. It produces you know. Um, uh, pigments and dyes and all the rest of it. I can't find a financial on this company past 2018. I went looking. I don't see anything interesting in the chart. Um, this seems like an odd request. And that's pretty much what I'm going to say about it. Um, yeah, earnings are in a couple of days. I didn't see any. I, I couldn't find anything else about the company. It's still trading, clearly. Um, but I don't see anything in that chart pattern that tells me that there's any 
change in sentiment or direction. There's just a bunch of bouncing around. Um, so this is the play thing. Volatility is increased. This is just the play thing of a, what, what a small cap company in a marginal sector looks like. It's really not all that interesting. I'm just going to stop there. TRMD, on the other hand, or in PLC, Class A shares of a of a an old UK shipping company, like established 1889 or something like that, has been on a tear. From the moment the the war opened, it's profited very handsomely. Here's the here's the beginning of the war. Here are here's what's going on. Now they move like fuel oil and you know they move nasty shit, right? It's mostly what they move. They move a lot of the dirty petrochemicals like fuel oil and naphtha and shit like that. Um, and they're making money. 17.5% yield. They're trading in the PDE of four. They've got zero debt on their balance sheets. On their balance sheet, they are now, right now, at current prices, they are a cash-generating machine. So they've been back to profitability for the last couple of years because day rates have exploded. Um, if you check Fernley's um, uh, site, you can get some... You get a, a, a good snapshot. There's a that's for release has got a great dashboard of all the tanker rates and the day rates at, across the entire shipping industry. It's very, very good actually. Um, for again, you're not gonna get a lot of granular data, but if you just want a snapshot of what's going on and some, you know, some decent historical charts, you can see what's going on. We are in a bull market for shipping. That's why we're you know, we have shipping and logistics in the portfolio, right? The the stocks in the portfolio. This is another idea on that front. The thing I will say the say about this that I don't, and I don't know enough about the company to make an intelligence discussion on, is that I've noticed that the top trailing twelve month quarterly top line number, the revenue, is degrading. Now that's because we've also seen, you know, a the day rates for ships are, you know, have been up and down. And they follow, they've kind of followed this pattern. So you could ask yourself, you know, with the next earnings report, which I think is in 10 days, are they going to, you know, show an expansion of revenue? Because, you know, tanker rates started to improve around December. If so, then they were going to, then they have, a, or no late November, early December, then they're going to have a good quarter. And as long as their quarter shows that they're, they have a better, if they have a better top line number in this earnings report than the last one, even if it's flat, even if it's just slightly better, right? Then probably gonna have the stocks are probably gonna have a very good 2024. So something to consider. Okay. So again, kind of like Petrobras and others, these these stocks that are paying unbelievable um, dividend rates. You know, we have one in our, we have one in the, the newsletter portfolio in the similar sector that whose management finally saw the light and like, yeah, buy some long-term charters, um, put some of your ships on long-term charters and, you know, stabilize the revenue flow and then pay a nice strong dividend to your, to your, uh, your shareholders and your stock price will be nice and will be solid for the next five years. And you turn the company into a 12% bond what you need to do when the fed's at five and a half percent when the fed was at zero percent no you you let the stock be volatile but now no all right next oh i forgot to animate this chart let's do this one over here this is again another um this is now the breakwave dry bulk shipping etf i guess this is actually a stock i've considered putting in the uh portfolio and i decided to go for a specific stock as opposed to this one i could have done i could have done this if i wanted to and i thought about it a few months ago. Um, it's very simple. This is a very simple analysis. There was a breakout in, this is February, January, to November, which we would expect, supporting what we're seeing in TORM, right? And um, I would say that we're probably clear to this series of lows in here at around 20 bucks. So there's another 40% upside on this stock this ETF this year, this is telling us there. And this, all you really have to do is watch the, the bulk rate shipping prices and they're looking pretty good. Supermicro 
Computer Incorporated. I don't know much about this company at all. I think it's tangentially an AI play. Well, looking at the chart, it probably is. Um, pure technical read here. Ignore the two. It doesn't ma- does not matter. Um, this is a massive move from around 275 a share to 1,077 a share. Last week, this is a weekly chart, by the way, not a monthly. Weekly chart, blow off top, hammer down, uh, reaction rally. Back up, we couldn't break the previous high, broke the previous low. This rally is probably over. As a matter of fact, I will be shocked if it goes higher from here. So, you know, sell a rhino horn, buy a fish hook, right? Here's your rhino horn. Now the question is, where's it going to correct to? And as I don't normally use things like Fibonacci retracements and, and whatnot, I think it's, you could also run a, uh, 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 an extended moving average series. You can do two things. You can run a Fibonacci series on the low to this high. This is roughly an $800 move. Therefore, this should probably give back about 400, 400 bucks because the size of the move is $800. So in a Fibonacci, a 50% Fibonacci retracement would take you back towards around $600, um, 400, about 675 or a 30 or 62 points. Uh, the, the 38% line would be around 500. I'm thinking between 650 and 550 is where the stock's going to end up on the bounce, and then the market will figure out where it's going to be from there. Or, and here's in the here's a secret for everybody. I don't use it often. I, as a matter of fact, don't use it at all because I don't like, I don't recommend this kind of trading anymore. I don't do it. But with a stock that did this, run the following um, exponential moving average series. 11, 22, 55, and 144. You can also run the 288 if you really want. Okay. The 11 should avert, the 11 should be crossing the 22, and you should be looking at the 55 for a correction back to the 55. I when I used to trade and I used to uh, you, know, you get big moves like this you now have to use moving averages to your advantage and I am a big fan of the 11 22 55 144 series. Okay? Just telling you. So basically 11 week extent, exponential moving average quarter. 22 roughly two quarters. 55 roughly um a year. 144 roughly 4 years. Or three years, 288, 288 week, six years. Okay. That's, it's a good set of signals if you want to trade like that. I'm not a big fan of it, but I use it. It's like Fibonacci. When you have something like this, my system doesn't really help you. All you can do is wait for the thing to, to finish, but you don't know when the stop, you don't know when the, the knife is falling. If you want, and if you want a, a toe dip moment, Fibonacci and the 11, 22, 55, 144 periods exponential moving average series is what you can use as a rough guess as to what everybody else is going to do. That's what you're using it for, okay? Again, I I don't use these often. I don't recommend them often, but for the traders in the audience and for the person who asked about this, these are your confirmation. These are your, these are your signals to give you an opportunity to figure out where you're going to set up. Um, you can continue to hold on to this, but if you are in a 250, if you haven't taken profit off the table at this point, you are hurting yourself. You should have at least half off the table at this point. You made a four bagger. Why in the fuck are you going to be greedy and uh, and hope for a six bagger? Take the four bagger on 50 percent or 60 percent of your position, and then wait for a correction. Even if you buy back in at seven hundred, after you sold at eight fifty, you know, still a twenty percent accumulative trade in terms of shares. If you think the stock is going to two thousand, okay. Not that I am recommending that, but do the math. The math is clear. Remember, first rule of investing: don't lose your money. Making money is the is the second sec, second step. All right. Uh, overseas dollar market. Let's do this one. Um, and yes, I still believe Chrissy is panicking. Let's start with the silver futures curve because there's an interesting thing happening at the silver futures curve versus what I saw in the yield curve, this, the the way the yield curve closed this week. Notice, okay, let's start with the yield curve. Notice that the long, that the 
that the final week in the series, which is the the ones that are marked, the bars that are marked each week, that's what the numbers are. Those are those are your those are your spreads between each period. Notice how they all degraded, how all of the inversions from six from the three six all the way out to the, to ten thirty have all degraded. So the three six spread degraded from five uh, basis points to six point three. The only one that didn't was the six month one year where it tightened up a little bit, and then the one two degraded a, a couple of points since Wednesday. This is since Wednesday, folks. No, yes, this is since Wednesday. Um, I didn't change the date, but this is Wednesday is the previous bar and the last one is Friday. So note the three five degraded. Note the five seven degraded. The seven ten degraded. The ten thirty degraded. Okay. But note the silver futures curve. On Wednesday, the black line was significantly lower than the blue line, which is the silver futures curve from nine eighteen from September eighteenth. So the silver futures curve is telling you that rates are going higher, and yet. We had a flattening of the yield curve, or the long end of the curve. We're back to having given back now three rate cuts by December. No rate cut in March. Practically no rate cut now in June. Well, 15 basis points now in June. This will be. This is going to be flat out to June. I'll be honest with you. This is going to be flat out to, to the way things are going. This could be flat out to December. So there's a little bit of a weird thing going on here where the SOFR futures curve is telling you that the bond market closed weirdly on Friday because this is the way they closed. And this shouldn't look like this. This should have fallen. The, the SOFR futures curve should have fallen if these ra- if if these two were mirror images, if these two were in, in, in concert. It means that somebody moved the U.S. Treasury market against the money markets, the domestic money markets on Friday afternoon. U.S. dollar closed just below 104, which kept, which kept the euro above 10, uh, because the euro stayed above 108, and uh, the pound stayed above a dollar 26. Japanese yen didn't move. The uh, Chinese yuan didn't move. Uh, the ruble didn't move. The U.S. German 10-year spread didn't move. The 10-year JGB didn't move. Copper didn't move. Gasoline didn't move. The whole friggin' market didn't move on Friday, except because the bond markets moved in the wrong direction, and everybody was confused. The Dow. Dow closed, but the equity markets, NVIDIA's earnings were good. The equity markets, mazel mazel tov. Again, we're buying bonds, and we're buying stocks, and we're buying gold. Really? There ain't that much cash out there, folks. It's a lie. All right. So, Dow was up 1.3%. Everybody else outperformed it. Even emerging markets um, um, stay pace with the Dow. But basically, the 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 the, the reality is is that every, it was a it was a buy in equity. It was a buy equities week. Um, and the Dow closed above 39,000 after a nice and yet volatile like three week, you know, two and a half week consolidation period, and then boom. Dow's going to 40 grand before it decides to consolidate. And then it may collapse, but we'll see. I, people calling for the dollars for the, the, the Dow to collapse and the equity markets to collapse, I think are missing the big capital flow picture. They don't understand. Mar- money is moving into tangible assets. It does not matter that those tangible assets are overpriced. It's like Florida real estate, folks. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm looking around and I'm looking at I'm looking at land prices out here and I'm going, I got you know, I got swamp land in Union County going for eleven thousand dollars an acre. I'm like, mound septic and all the rest of it, and I'm like, really, eleven grand an acre for swamp land in fucking Union County? You're out of your mind. It's four thousand dollars an acre stuff. But what are we gonna do? Um, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. That's what I'm trying to say. So, with that said, um, I'm out. So you guys be well. You take care. We'll talk soon. Keep your stick on the ice.